All right, Ling441, uh, this is going to be our first lecture for the semester. We're going to talk about basic acoustics and digital signal processing. Uh, so some of this is going to be a review, if you might recall, from Ling341, um, the basic acoustics part of it. Uh, so we'll just cover that in a few slides right at the beginning, uh, and then we'll get into the uh, digital signal processing or DSP part of the fun. Uh, right after that, which basically explains how you go from an analog representation or an analog signal sound wave um, to a digital format, which is the kind we actually always use when we're playing around with sounds in um, prot or on a computer. Um, so this will kind of set the foundation for the um, rest of the uh, sort of um, technical or digital analysis we'll do uh, throughout the rest of the semester. And normally when I teach this in person, I ask people if they have any questions so far uh, based on uh, the overall outline of the course or um, the course project, which you have to worry about through the rest of the semester. I don't know if you're going to have any questions at the moment um, because we're doing this in a different way. And either way, you can ask them right now because I'm recording this ahead of time. So we'll just move on. But if you have questions, feel free to send them to me or post them in the comments so that other people might benefit as well. Okay, so like I said, uh, I wanna go through a little bit of review of basic acoustics. Um, and we'll start out by thinking about uh, periodic sounds. And so a very basic example of a periodic sound is a bilabial trill, like, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm out of practice. I haven't done this for a while. <laughs> also, the beard's getting in the way um, of my bilabial trill. Uh, not really, but when you produce one of those sounds, what happens? So here's this little schematic of um, the two lips pressed against each other uh, with pressure building up in the air um, in the air inside your mouth. As it builds up, it eventually will pop these two lips open um, if it goes high enough, and then air will come out in a kind of sharp spike. Uh, and it goes through so quickly, um, it produces a Bernoulli effect, which brings the lips back together quite rapidly. And then the whole process repeats itself. The lips will pop open, come back together. And each time they pop open and come back together, you get a pulse of air um, going out into the world beyond your mouth. Uh, here's maybe a better example of what this sounds like. Maybe not, I should probably turn on my sound a bit. Yeah, hopefully you can hear that. It's that sound, but voiced. Uh, either way, we can kind of imagine this as this series of um, air pressure pulses uh, or peaks um, propagating out into the world beyond the speaker's lips. Uh, so taking that at a more simple level, rather than thinking about it in terms of the three dimensions that are actually those sound waves actually expand out into, we can look at this in sort of a one dimensional representation. Again, uh, excuse the beautiful artwork. Uh, I'm not that talented with PowerPoint, but you can think of air as consisting of floating air molecules because that is actually what air consists of. So um, in three dimensions, you can imagine how that would look, but we can look at this in one dimension where it's just kind of a row of air molecules, which are basically normally about evenly spaced apart from each other, although they're gonna be kind of moving around and bouncing around. So there's gonna be little discontinuities in the spacing um, if you do look at it in uh, real life. But simple case, because we're kind of doing physics here. And so physics, it's always easy to go down to the simple uh, and get an intuitive understanding of it. Normally, these molecules are going to be suspended and evenly spaced apart from each other. And what's going to happen, say, if I get a pressure pulse coming out of my mouth, like in a um, bilabial trill, um, also we're going to push sort of on one end of this series of molecules, like over here. So what happens? Uh, and this is again where your sort of physical intuitions will hopefully come into play and be useful. So this is kind of like a row of billiard balls or croquet balls since it's, it's summertime, maybe croquet balls is a better way to think about this, but this ball is gonna get pushed over in this direction. And since this one is right here, it's gonna bounce against that one as well, or this molecule will bounce against that molecule. Um, so uh, when that happens, that force gets transferred, this ball gets, or molecule gets stopped. This one starts moving, bounces against that one, so on and so forth, and the force kind of transfers its way down the line. Um, that is pretty intuitive and easy to understand what you might not have thought about before, or maybe not since the last time I talked about this in 341, is that the first molecule is gonna bounce back past its initial rest position. So this one got shoved initially, it hits this one, and then eventually it goes back the other way past where it began, and we kind of get this wide space in between the first two molecules when this one is hitting the next one down the line. So there is 
basically no space between molecules here and there's a lot of space in between these two molecules here. Uh, and eventually that pattern will kind of propagate down the line uh, as it goes to the end of the series of molecules in the air. Um, so we'll get this sort of alternating pattern where you have uh, molecules close to each other um, when they're kind of going back and forth in this pattern. They initially started out here. So this is where uh, the second one comes back to meet the first one. The initial force is now being pushed against this fourth one, so on and so forth. <clears throat> so like I said, alternating pattern of molecules close to each other and molecules far apart from each other. I don't know how much longer I can get away with saying molecules without really screwing it up. But um, besides that, you can think about this a little bit like it's a bucket brigade. Uh, and I should really almost um, pause the lecture here so I can go get an object which would be useful for this. Uh, but basically, I'll take my, you know, this is even more appropriate. I have a glass of water here. So uh, you can think about it like if I have um, a fire over here on my left and I have a source of water here on my right, what you can do um, to try to put out the fire over on this side is you get a source of water over on this side and then you line up a whole bunch of people in between the source of water and the fire and you just grab water, hand it from one person to the next, hand, hand, sorry, this is not working at all. So it goes from one person to the next. <laughs> one person in the line does not need to carry the water all the way from the source to the fire itself. Uh, that person can just stay put in one spot, grab the water from the person to the right and hand it over to the person to the left. The first person in this line actually gets the water from wherever, the faucet or the hydrant or what have you. And the last person pours the water onto the fire. Nobody has to actually move. Um, the people in the middle are just kind of going back and forth like this. Each one of those people is like a molecule in this series of molecules. They're just gonna kind of bounce back and forth. And um, the force is kind of in, of the initial pressure pulse coming out of the mouth is like that water trans, um, traveling all the way down the line until it gets to the end and gets poured on the fire. So that's a bucket brigade. And this is kind of how a sentence works as well, right? Um, the force travels through the individual molecules in the line. It doesn't push one molecule all the way from the beginning to the end of the line. Okay, when that happens, um, you get what is called a compression wave. So you have individual molecules vibrating back and forth around some equilibrium point, um, and they set up a compression wave. And what gets compressed here is the space between the molecules. So this is what it looks like when you're pushing things together. There's lots of compression there. Uh, alternately, things move apart um, and you get what's called a rarefaction. Um, yeah, so I'll show you that second technical term here on the next slide. Uh, in the meantime, though, I do have some um, videos of things blowing up. So why don't we watch them? Because that's always fun. Um, sort of related to fire. So I don't know, remember, I don't really remember where I got this somewhere on the internet. The internet is a big and crazy place. So this is just a video where somebody set um, like a charge, a dynamite charge or something underneath this car and they're gonna blow it up. Uh, so we can watch what happens. Kaplui, um, isn't that cool? And one of the reasons I wanna show this, because I think it's not only fun, but educational, is that when this shock wave goes off, you can see, so it bursts into flame here and the car is disintegrated, what have you. Um, the important part is that um, that shock wave actually pushes the air molecules so closely together because it's so intense um, that the air basically becomes denser and it refracts the light so that um, you can actually see that shock wave spreading out from the initial blast all the way around here in a spherical pattern, right? Um, those air molecules are pushed together even more closely than they normally are, right? So much so that we can actually see that compression. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I'll give you another one of an even bigger explosion. Yeah. I think you've seen this one before as well. So this is back in the old days, like in the 50s, when they used to have these atom atomic bomb tests down in um, Nevada. Although who knows, this is probably like in Siberia or something because Nevada doesn't really have pine trees like this. Uh, at any rate, what happens? Boom, they exploded an atomic bomb. Things got pretty serious there. And you can see these um, individual trees got pushed in the same direction, of course, by the shock wave of the atomic bomb blast. Uh, but then after it passes them, they're gonna go back to the other side. So straight up and down is their normal position, but you get that kind of um, 
blowback effect, as it were, um, where they have to recoil back past the initial position. Um, and those that can't sort of bend with that intense wind get knocked over and then the world ends. But uh, so the trees are acting a little bit like the molecules do in um, a normal sound wave um, in that they're kind of vacillating back and forth around that equilibrium point. Uh, and trees will do it for a little while. Sound, it's a little bit different. The, you can push the molecules around a little bit easier um, and they're a little bit less constrained. Uh, okay, so like I said, this is a compression wave. So it's a wave where we're pushing things together and then we're pulling them apart, basically. Um, and that push together is what transfers down the line of molecules. So when you have uh, two molecules pressed together closely, you get an area of high pressure, which is called compression. And when they're far apart from each other, that's an area of low pressure, which, low pressure, which is called a rarefaction. Uh, and normally compression waves will consist of these alternating areas of high and low pressure. And again, not just in one dimension, but in three dimensions, right? Uh, so it travels out like that shock wave from the exploding car. Okay, so we can um, quantify what's going on here in a couple of different ways, uh, or at least one way which matters to us in this course. Um, and primarily we can use, say, a microphone, um, which you can consider a pressure level meter. Uh, so this is going to measure how intense the pressure or how much the pressure changes as a sound wave goes through the microphone. So microphones have these um, things called diaphragms, which are these kind of thin uh, filaments of um, conductive metal, uh, which they can link up to a circuit. And they're thin enough that they can kind of um, get pushed back and forth ever so slightly with um, variations in air pressure when a sound wave encounters them or it encounters a sound wave. Uh, and so those pressure variations, because it's hooked up to some sort of circuit, um, can be converted into electrical voltage, which you can transfer to, say, like a computer um, or a phone or whatever. Uh, and you can measure the pressure variations in voltage or, sorry, the voltage variations and record the sound in that fashion. Um, we come, as human beings, we come with built-in pressure level meters. They're called ears. Uh, so ears, uh, kind of what corresponds to those diaphragms are your eardrums, um, which are these thin membranes at the sort of back end of your ear canal, about an inch into your head. Uh, they move back and forth with air pressure variations as they go into your skull. Um, they get amped up those pressure variations or the eardrum itself is connected to a first a series of bones in your middle ear and then into an uh, interesting structure called the cochlea, which we'll talk about later, which uh, links up to the um, nerve uh, fibers in your brain. So there's kind of a translation mechanism, a double translation mechanism, which converts the air pressure variations and sound out here in the world into neurochemical signals in your brain. Um, it's kind of fascinating how that works. And somehow in the midst of uh, all the gray matter in there. We experience that as sound uh, and get some sense of how the pressure is changing as uh, we hear sounds in the world around us. Um, yeah, so they work in similar ways. Uh, it's, we can't really record in the same way um, what's going on with our ears as we can with our microphones. So we'll kind of stick with this level because it's all open to inspection. Um, but just so we understand what's going on here, uh, let's say um, we have a pressure level meter, like a microphone, uh, and we put it in sort of the um, pathway of this um, sound wave, which is coming down the line. And the way I'm representing this is that I have time changing in this direction. So this is earlier and this is later. And at this particular spot, I have a pressure level meter. What is the output of this pressure level meter going to look like? Can you give me a hint? I'm going to actually pause the um, I'm going to pause the video for the moment and pick this up again in part two. But think about this. <laughs> 